welcome back to Hein under Heart. Um, we are still in our kind of uh, source mode at the moment. Uh, and we, how about we got a show for you today? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> 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 the Buckle soul. your seatbelt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we have. Yeah, we, as Rob said, we, we seek the source. Um, it's, it's one of those things that I think for a long time people, uh, I wouldn't say they didn't want to talk about it because people do talk about it, um, but it, just not in a very nice way um, for a lot of fairly decent reasons. Um, and uh, it's, and, but, but that didn't stop us. I think we really want, we, it's a very, very interesting story. Um, and last time and last episode, we looked at all the different uh, scripts that we had access to, uh, which led us all the way up to very near whatever became the kind of the shooting script ish. Um, and so we had a little bit of insight into sort of what happened up until that point. Um, now, I don't know if anybody actually pays attention to the end of the credits, but for about three episodes now, I've been putting little bits on after the end of the credits, um, just because, you know, I'm a Marvel fan, so I'm just kind of, you know, just nicking their idea, basically. And just yeah. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the last one, there was a special appearance. Um, and for uh, for those who didn't see it then, here he is. It's Connor the monkey. Yes. Yes, a beautiful, a beautiful thing. Uh, coming to a t-shirt near you, probably, uh, if you're a Patreon, which we should also talk about briefly. Ah, uh, yes. Um, so we recently launched a Patreon. Now, this was a very tricky thing for me because I'm very adamant that, that all of the things that we do, we do it for, for love and we do it because we're fans. We want fans to enjoy this too. There's, it's not a case of ego or money or anything like that. But there are little things that, uh, that go into creating the show that, that require a little bit of, uh, sort of financial input, um, not least of which is the, uh, the process by which we make these videos, uh, which unless you go pro was cutting off at 40 minutes, which wasn't the most professional thing in the world. No. So we launched a Patreon to kind of help us with that. And Thank goodness uh, some of you have come to our rescue. So a uh, huge, huge thanks to Gerda, David and Jill for uh, being our first three Patreons. You have already made things better for us. You have made yes. uh, this episode specifically and, and all the ones uh, after um, much, much better. So thank you from the bottom of all of our hearts. Um, so uh, for those of you who are interested, if you would like to sign up to Patreon, you will get every episode early so you will see it um at least sort of two three days earlier um than uh, when it's released on youtube you'll also get outtakes of me messing stuff up um, <laughs> all of us <laughs> all of us messing stuff up i think yes. uh, joe's in the clear so far i think but you know who knows what will happen <laughs> that's <laughs> right <laughs> and any kind of outtakes and uh, and stupid things like that um so uh, we'll put them up too uh you'll also have access we're going to do some sort of uh sort of semi-regular kind of zoom meetups and things as well where you guys can yeah. pop on and we can all sort of talk about Highlander, um which will be good fun too so uh and there'll be other things to come too um, we'll, we'll think of other things to put up there um and uh, uh to try and sort of reward you for for helping us out which we really really appreciate it so uh so go check us out patreon just search on the heart you'll find it so <laughs> <laughs> so here we go. So the last episode was kind of, uh, kind of easier in a way because we could just talk about the things that didn't happen, um, and and it, it was a way of sort of exploring it all without without having to kind of address the real issue, which is what did happen. Um, so where do we start? Um, <laughs> I, I mean, beginning. Yes. at the beginning, yes, I am at, well, yeah, I imagine a fair few people who are watching this will have maybe seen the source, or at least maybe seen the first 10 minutes of it before they turned it off. Um, or certainly have heard about it, or well, been warned exactly. about it. Exactly, yeah, because <laughs> it lives in infamy. To be fair, the first 10 minutes are amazing. <laughs> the opening credits? No. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, depending on which version, I think, as well, uh, is the issue. So, Rob, I know you, I, I'm going to defer this to you because you've seen this uh, film a lot more than I have. I've seen it a lot more than anybody has. <laughs> or anybody should, 
Oh wait. Yeah, that, that, that's good. Yeah, well, that was implied, yeah. But <laughs> the, the source is one of those stuff. I mean, we all liked to bitch about Highlander too for for various reasons and make fun hedgehogs, planets and all that kind of stuff. And it takes a special sauce for want of a better word to create something worse than that. You know? So yeah. Uh, base, oh yeah, uh, let's see, here we go. <clears throat> I'm, <clears throat> I'm no alcohol yet, I should have drank more. Yeah. <clears throat> um, basically, the, the film we saw, the first film version of the source we saw was the Russian DVD when it was leaked, got out, yeah. pre-order, you could, anybody could buy it, so I'm not entirely sure how it was leaked, um, got out and basically post-apocalyptic world, Duncan McLeod's running around rooftops playing Batman. Mm. Um, yeah, there's, there's a group of immortals searching for the source, mm -hmm. the source of immortality that nobody's been searching for in the entire history of Highlander. Mm -hmm. It must be, everybody knows about it now and is looking for it. Yeah, yeah. Which seems on par. <clears throat> but yeah, the... Uh. the <laughs> The uh, the Russian DVD was the best version the source we've ever seen at the moment, mm -hmm. but yeah, the, the the source is pretty bad. Um, the DVD version that was released by the producers, when we were told don't buy the Russian DVD because it's not our preferred cut, it was going to be in sci-fi and it was sold in DVD and it was sort of chopped into pieces, mm -hmm. and basically. All the good stuff, I mean, they took out some bad stuff as well, but they took out all, a lot of the, the meat of the story and turned it into a, a sci-fi TV special, Yeah, basically. So you get uh, in the DVD release for a Russian DVD, you've got the Mythos opening with a long speech talking about the source and myth and legend, and it sets you up for something, an epic journey. Um, and then the DVD version that was released by the producer's cut was somebody on PowerPoint listing three things about immortals. <laughs> they can't have children, they die when their head's cut off, and there can be only one or something. Mm -hmm. I mean, the start of that movie, or that version, <laughs> made you want to go, what the hell? Because <laughs> we all know Peter Winkfield can do a speech and he's got that voice and he can tell you something, no matter how bad the story's going to be or how bad the script is, he can yeah. make it sound good. Yeah. And in the DVD version that was released finally, it, it just sounded bad. No, yeah. it was terrible. But yeah, there was a voiceover that they added um, to try and explain a way through the movie because mm -hmm. people would be very, very confused. Yeah. So they had to explain it to them mm -hmm. or women explain it. Yeah. I think, uh, it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Technically, yeah. 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 Um, well. And it's just like you've been carried through this film with no, and then you've basically got an ending that's explained to you even worse. This is what we meant by the film. <laughs> yeah. Explain middle and end. It's just it, yeah. It's, it, it reeks. Yeah. It's, yeah, it was. I mean, it's well, a lazy way out, basically, of, yeah. of having, uh, you know, just deciding to take a film, chop it up, yeah. um, and it's not the first time that that happened. To be fair, um, with the Highlander uh, movies, um, and uh, yeah, well, yeah, well, this makes no sense now. Ah, it's fine. We'll just put a voiceover over. Yeah, we'll uh, dub it. Be okay. We'll dub it and we'll explain it at the end. I mean, everybody loves a bit of exposition in a movie. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um. So yeah, it's, it's definitely one of those, it feels, I mean, it wasn't meant to be a made-for-TV movie, no. but it feels like it. Yeah. Well, I think one of the things that was clear from, I think I mentioned last in the last episode, was when, when writers uh, were delivering um, scripts that uh, were larger in scope and, and more epic and had a lot more going on, uh, they were, you know, they're being told, well, no, this is too expensive. And the budget for the source at the end of the day ended up being minuscule compared to 
any of the other sequels. Um, and there was clearly never uh, that, that money, whether they couldn't raise the finance at the end of the day uh, for the movie they wanted to make, or whether they just assumed that you know, they could make it for whatever they had. Um, it was always going to be a bit of a push to, to, to do that. So I think, I, you know, I, yeah, I, I think there was, <laughs> as of that, what, what do you do? You know, you've got, you've got this, this idea that was started at the beginning and you've, and you've looked and you, and, and the progression of all of these scripts and the different ideas all basically around the same idea. And, you know, and at the end of the day, you've gone, well, okay, but, but can we go and shoot it in Eastern Europe uh, with a, um, a crew that don't really know what they're doing and will work for peanuts? Yes. Right. Okay, great. Let, let's go and do that then. Um, yeah. and, and you're never going to have a great product at the end of that. I mean, um, when we talked about the scripts, the scripts, the, the half script that I read, and at the start of that, there was no Duncan McLeod. No. When you start a project, or is it any project that relies on its name, the Highlander, mm. and there isn't one, yeah. you're, you're literally stepping on the wrong, starting on the wrong foot. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Um, you can't make anything. You can't just then tailor it at the end to something because you've already started from the wrong process. Yeah. Well, I mean, we, I guess we're, we're heading back into the script stuff a little bit, but I think, I wonder if some of that, and this is something that ideally would be interesting to ask, uh, you know, Peter Davis or something like that, but I guess they, if you think about the, what they'd done from the end of the series, where they'd gone for the Raven and they tried to, uh, to really go away from Duncan and go away from everything else they'd done so far, um, I wonder if that was another attempt at doing that initially, was to say, you know, okay, we've done Endgame and, you know, it's kind of like the end of this sort of story or whatever. Now let's just carry on the idea of Im Immortals because let's not forget that, that the, some of the early versions of the reboot script um, were... Well, no, no, there were even a TV series idea, as I recall, tailored towards teens and like teenage immortals. And, and it was, there was a, a version written by the, the woman who wrote the script for Twilight. So not the author, but the, the, oh, okay. uh, but the screenwriter of, of okay. the movie Twilight, I think. Fairly certain I got that right. Um, so that would have been a whole different thing. And I, I, I kind of wonder if that was the idea that they go like, okay, so we've done Duncan now, we've done all of that. Uh, let's try and do something completely different with a whole new raft of immortals looking for the source and let's just kind of go. And because that kind of makes sense in what we ended up with, it's, it's what, and then they had that idea of doing something very different and then had to shoehorn Duncan back in again, yeah. which is why we've wound up with a, with a, with a movie that feels like nothing like um, Duncan isn't Duncan. Uh, right. You know, thank God, you know, Mythos and Joe are as, as Mythos and Joey as they can be. Um, but, but yeah, it's, I guess it, that kind of makes sense that that's what happened. They, they started off at one thing and then, and then had to evolve and change it. And ultimately it didn't, it didn't really work. Yeah. Yeah, those early scripts definitely felt to me, um, especially uh, Joel uh, Swazon. I know I'm going to totally butcher his last name. Sorry, Joel. Um, definitely felt like you know this was not not a reboot, but you know a revival yeah. and kind of a handing uh, handing off of the baton by Duncan, which is why he you know sort of plays the Ramirez part in it and only yeah. shows up for a small period of time um although he does ultimately resolve it but like those early scripts too don't have the big you know end uh that what we saw that we got there's no like definitive this is the power of the immortals and the, this yeah. is a continuation and stuff it was like you know no we, we it, it was almost like well we've broken the cycle and now anything can happen and there's more immortals out there. So it was totally like a continuation. It could have been a pilot for a new series even. 
yeah. you know so I, that and that's why i kind of liked it because i kind of felt like especially with uh the other sequels even you know highlander 2 you know 3 and endgame to an, a certain extent that they were they were just trying to tell the same story again and again and yeah, yeah, yeah. And here was something that was markedly different, um, especially in the early scripts that was like this, you know, that it kind of got my excitement again about the franchise. It's like, cool, now we, we're not stuck in a rut anymore. You know, that's, that's why I love the series because the series was like, no, you know, the gathering still hasn't happened and yeah. uh, we can have stories in all eras and different times. And this to me was like, here, we've just, we've, gotten rid of you know this impending thing of the end and there can be only one and now it, anything can happen and that would have been a great start to either a trilogy of films or more or uh, you know a series or you know a broader launch for the franchise into comics series movies yeah. and all that kind of stuff and unfortunately uh you know i wasn't the uh, one of the producers and i wasn't in charge of it so you know yeah. that didn't no, I know. And it, it's such a shame. I mean, I know there was a lot of anticipation for the source uh, when they first started talking about it. Uh, I can remember I was at the Leeds, uh, I don't know if it's the last UK one, um, and they showed a little bit of footage uh, from it. So it was obviously still in production at that point. Um, yeah. So they just had some teaser stuff, some kind of rushes, I guess, that they, they'd managed to pull in and, and air there. Um, which were, they looked great and, you know, and, you know, you know, make no mistake about it, you know, Brett Leonard is, is a very visual filmmaker, which is yeah. a, a prerequisite for doing a Highlander movie. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the shots look great. I'll never remember Mythos walking down the hallway with purpose and, you know, and there was a real buzz watching this stuff. It looked amazing. And, and seeing The Guardian was kind of a, took a, you know, it took a step back and I thought, okay, that's, it's, uh, yeah, not quite what I was expecting, but interesting. But, you know, let's see what they'll they'll do with that. And uh, I think by the time I actually got to see the movie, I think possibly its reputation had already preceded it, um, which uh, made sort of viewing it uh, without kind of having an opinion quite difficult. Um, but yeah, for me, yeah. So I think I think the biggest. One of the biggest issues for me um, is is Duncan because he, you know, he's kind of, you know, he's, I won't even say necessarily Batman, but, you know, he's kind of, uh, you know, uh, more, more akin actually to Oliver Queen in sort of series one and two of Arrow where he's uh, just uh, very jaded and kind of, but still skulking around on rooftops, uh, saving women from being raped and that kind of thing. Um, and you know which is you know maybe maybe there's but but why why is he like that where's where's the reasoning for this you know what what led him down that path you know i, I felt things like that were were markedly missing and then and then obviously yeah just the, just the fact that you know they you know with all due respect to them they they got the best they could out of what they had is one of the films that was mm -hmm. on the, the forefront of digital and uh you know really employing uh digital effects and green screen as much as possible to get the most they could out of, of the kind of the, the very small kind of budget that they had um but but it it, it can't help but show that that's that's I what think, it is i think that what you know now it's great we're talking about this because now i think i finally have while you were describing that figured out what really bugged me about Duncan and the source. And it wasn't just the fact that he was, you know, kind of gruff and dark and withdrawn, but it was the fact that we did that a couple times, at least during the series. I mean, after Tessa died, he yeah. kind of did the same thing. And then very, very much so in the final season, after he killed Richie, you know, he renounced uh, any kind of violence. He renounced even fighting with a sword he renounced, you know, engaging in the game, although he still helped people. And it was like, so how are we back to that again? I mean, we've we've done that with this character. Why are we doing it again? So, yeah. yeah. Handler has a bad habit of taking immortality and saying, yeah, it's a curse. 
and people are depressed. But Connor, throughout most of the movies, was so depressed and so dour that doing it again with Duncan yeah. just felt a little off. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So what we know, Duncan, and the series and the end game and stuff like that, when stuff like this happens, he would try and do his best. He's been through wars. He's been through a lot of things. Mm -hmm. the, the idea of him being completely insular and no talking to anybody and just skulking on rooftops, playing Batman. He's still trying to do good, but he doesn't want to be in the yeah. world kind of thing. Yeah. I thought it was it's been done like it's been done to death mm -hmm. in yeah. the franchise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's just it, always, it never sat right. But I seem to remember, and this is showing my elderly adult brain. Um, while uh, while we were talking, also it kicked into my head that uh, I had friends at the time that um, you know uh, obtained. Um, uh, uh, movies through uh, nefarious ways, but I remember, I distinctly remember that there was like an early cut of the Russian version that was circulating that had a timer light on it, like it was a work print. Right. And I don't remember if that was distinctly different than the Russian DVD we got or not. So I'm wondering if there's even another version that <laughs> it's, is floating out there other than the one that we might be revealing about later in this. Well, this is it. I think, uh, yeah, as, um, there's only one person who can probably answer that question. Yes, <laughs> yes. And uh, genuinely, I can't believe that we've, we've actually got him on. We've been incredibly lucky um, so far uh, in our very sort of uh, short, short life. Um, of having uh, the directors for uh, Highlander 3 and Highlander 4 on. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't want to leave it at that. We, you know, we really had to, to have uh, Brett Leonard on. Yes. Um, and uh, I genuinely didn't think we had a hope in hell. <laughs> um, but we do. So, with that in mind, <laughs> I'd love to introduce Brett Leonard. Hey, hey, how you doing? <laughs> so, uh, so uh, you, you, we're here to talk about uh, Highlander the Source. We are, yeah. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll, so, I'll... <laughs> you know, it, this is, this is a, a, a really interesting opportunity, you know, because there's so many things that happen um, in independent filmmaking. And you know, I've I've been both a studio filmmaker and an independent filmmaker, and uh, Highlander: The Source is one of the great cautionary tales of my of my uh, career. Um, and you know, I got I got into it because I was a Highlander fan. Yeah. Um, you know, and actually, I was living in Australia at the time that I was first approached by uh, by the producers of the Highlander series. Um, and uh, I had actually met Russell Mulcahy and sort of partied with him because he lived in Australia. And so he became a friend and, and I was just a huge fan of a lot of his work. And, um, you know, he did a lot of great music video work and, and you know, the first Highlander just blew my mind. And I, I was such a fan. That, that is really why I got into it. Um, little did I know. <laughs> <laughs> Because, you know, as, as we're, you guys are all aware, I mean, first of all, unfortunately, no one has seen the movie I made. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and there's a story to why that happened. So, and, and I think it's, it, it would be interesting for people that are fans of franchises and for, you know, fandom to understand what happens uh, sometimes with, with feature filmmaking. And uh, I'm not, I'm not here to, to take, you know, to, to shirk responsibility, but at the same time, uh, you know, there's a story of why and how things happen uh, about, around a certain film. And, uh, you know, as I got into it, my intentions were to, to make a great Highlander film. And uh, I had not, in all honesty, really been a fan of the TV show, mm -hmm. right, at that time. So I, I knew the, the films. Um, 
I thought the first one was really the best, you know, uh, in many in many ways, and, and some of the sequels had issues and problems. Although the number two was really interesting, having been shot in Buenos Aires and you know all that stuff. But as I got into it, I learned I was going to be going to Lithuania to make the film. Uh, it was going to be a very low budget movie, and and uh, you know this is something that literally came about as I was getting involved with the movie. Um, and, uh, you know, I, as you guys probably know, the, the, the first Highlander had a pretty good budget, you know, and, and so did the second Highlander, you know, and at some point I'd love to send you my cut of the movie, which I do, I do have. Really? Uh, you know, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it exists, it exists. Okay. And, uh, you know, not to say that there aren't uh, issues with that because there was, uh, when you hear what happened, you'll you'll you hear you know you hear where the <laughs> where the compromises had to be made. But I'm I'm proud of 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 some many of the things I did in the film, uh, and the where it went and what was actually finally delivered uh, has nothing to do with the the film we shot. Um, you know the part point of view. I mean I. I actually have never fully seen the bad version that uh, because I got so upset watching it. I was like, right off the bat, they had, you know, they changed the point of view from, um, from a cloud's point of view to the point of view of the, of the mortal woman played by Tecla Rutan. Uh, and there was like weird, like, cheap text and I mean basically where it changed but that story about how it changed is is interesting. One of the things that you know we've discovered in researching this and uh, preparing is there yeah. are many many versions of the script from first draft to shooting script yeah. so I was kind of curious when you came in yeah. how how done was the script and how ready was it to shoot? It, it was not ready uh, and uh, and one of the issues was the, the budget because, you know, I kept thinking this was going to be some something and I was going to have a certain amount of resource. And then that kept changing literally constantly throughout the process. So one of the things that happened is, uh, you know, the, the reasons for making the film and the reasons uh, business wise for uh, creating the, the production that did happen were not in line with, you know, let's make the, the best Highlander film possible. Right. Um, you know, I I was given the cast. I was given the cast from the from the uh, uh, the TV show, and I like I I like them all. I mean, Adrian Paul. I really enjoyed uh, my time with him. He's he's a great guy. Um, uh, Peter Winfield. You know, Mythos. All, all, all of the people. The guy that played Joe. All it, it was a great group of people, and they had you know already bonded because they had had this hit movie. Uh, hit hit series yeah. um and so so but we were picking up from the series not from the films really yeah. you know and so there was a whole sort of cognitive disconnect for me on that mm -hmm. um but uh i wanted to bring something from the sort of mythic aspect of the first film into this and you know they wanted to also sort of conclude the series mm -hmm. with with what happens uh in this film so that was a big you know that's a big tall order to do on a film that you know was just a couple million uh, you know i think the overall budget of the film probably ended up being around three million dollars um and there's over a thousand effect shots in this movie yeah okay so so when i say cutting off you know biting off more than we could chew it was extreme i get to uh lithuania uh, in in the summer and it's kind of nice in Lithuania. I was in Vilnius uh, You know and there's a there's an old studio there Vilnius Kino Studio Which comes out of the Stalin era of Shooting and, and all the Lithuanian people were fantastic the people that you know worked at the studio But the whole thing was run by the Lithuanian Mafia um, So so the whole nature of the production had all kinds of undercurrents and other things surrounding it and uh, this is, again, this is a, a, an amazing tale, which is why I wanted to tell it, of, you know, independent filmmaking, uh, where you, you, you know, one adventure turns into another <laughs> very quickly. <laughs> and, and so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm designing the, the film. I'm trying to get, you know, the things designed in a way that can uh, actually be done within this budget. Now, 
that kind of budget did go a long way in Lithuania, I will say that. And the Lithuanian people uh, that worked on the film are, you know, were not getting paid much. And this became an issue. I mean, there's so many stories here. I'll have to pick and choose the ones I tell. But it, as in at one point, uh, I had a, a, a wonderful assistant who spoke five languages. She was a Lithuanian woman, Lithuanian woman. And, and I started learning the history of Lithuania, which is very fraught history. That's for sure. And it, it, it came up multiple times in the shooting. Uh, and I'll try to tell those stories. But she came to me and said, you know, we're, this is when we're in pre-production. We... Uh, I just wanted you to know is uh, we need to, you know, some of, the, some of the people working on the film need to get some shoes. And is there any way you could help us get paid? And I'm like, what? Uh, uh, what do you mean? And he says, yeah, because we're going to go into winter and we're gonna be shooting in winter and we can't afford shoes. I'm like, well, what, what do you mean? You're working on the film. What, well, they haven't paid us for months. And the way it works here is we just kind of wait until they feel to pay us. Um, so I went to the producers. Uh, I, I'm going to not name names in this because I don't want to get in huge trouble. So I went and I said, look, I'm not the captain of a slave ship. You pay these people by tomorrow morning or I am on a plane out of here. Uh, and then they got paid. But they were paid very, very, very small. Um, they were great people. Uh, I had to teach them all about green screen and doing things on a technologically sophisticated uh, visual effects film, which I knew because that was my background. And uh, they, they learned fantastically. They were, they were just, you know, great crew on that level, but it was not like we were coming into a place that knew how to make this movie or knew how to make it at the budget that we were doing it at. So um, that was a, a, a big part of, of some of the stuff we were dealing with. And then, so after that, I was realized, well, this is going to be interesting. This is, uh, you know, obviously there's dynamics here that are different than what I've uh, dealt with before. And uh, the line producer was a very unusual guy, a German guy who uh, seemed very secretive about how the money was being spent, where it was going. And I'm like, well, I'm the you know, I'm the director. I need to see a budget. I need to sign a budget. And I was never given a budget or able to sign the budget, which in every other film I've ever done, it's like you sign a budget and then you sign off and I can do it for this. They never gave me that. So I started making, uh, writing a series of memos uh, that uh, maybe I'll publish them someday. I mean, that just literally, uh, was covering my ass of saying like, look, this is what we need to do. This is how we need to, because all these visual effects things. And I was, I would just make basically using these memos as a way of, of stating for, you know, uh, in a business sense, what, what was going on because I was, I was more and more and more concerned. Um, as we moved out of uh, uh, pre-production, one of the things that I did was I, I cast Christian Solomeno as the guardian yeah. And he was fantastic. He, and Christian is, is, a, is a friend to this day. And he really brought an amazing physicality to the role. He was a physical uh, avant-garde performer and actor. And um, I was really excited about what I was able to, to do with The Guardian, because I thought The Guardian was really critical to the story. Uh, and so that was, that was a positive. And so I, I had a good group of people going. And I was, you know, having fun with, with with Adrian and with, and then Tecla Rutten, we got Tecla and Tecla was, you know, is a very skilled uh, uh, Danish uh, actress and has been in a lot of great things like the American with George Clooney. And um, she's, you know, she's, she's, she's gone on to do great things and she's, she is a very good actress. So I was, you know, getting enthused about, boy, we're going to make a good Highlander film here, even though I feel like I've got, you know, three dimes to rub together to do it. And, and as we developed it, uh, there was a lot of, of consternation around the script because they wanted to do things that weren't possible. Uh, and so I had to, you know, limit things so that they were possible uh, to create. There was a lot of builds, uh, set builds, um, and the Lithuanian people were fantastic at that um, because they had done a number of, of those kinds of productions, uh, one of which uh, had just before we got their shot, which is the Elizabeth um, uh, with uh, uh, Helen Mirren. Mm. Uh, 
uh, which was a, it was a very, and I think Jeremy Irons did it, but it was, it was done also very cheaply. <laughs> Uh, and if you watch, if you watch that, you'll see the sets and all that. Some of those set pieces are in Highlander: The Source. <laughs> so, uh, so you know, again, I'm I'm just I'm just dodging and weaving as a director and a storyteller, trying to make you know this you know as good as it can be. And uh, and when we by the time we got to shooting, it was winter. Uh, it was late fall winter uh, in uh, Lithuania, and much of the film is exterior and a good chunk of it is exterior night. Mm -hmm. Now, this is the equivalent of shooting a movie in Siberia in the winter. I mean, it was freaking cold. It was just, it literally became uh, a kind of survival story. I mean, to, to survive each night, we had to, I, I had to put on like a, you know, a, a robot, I mean, a, an astronaut suit, you know, that was just multiple layers and parkas and all that just to survive. At one point, um, the actor that played Joe Dawes, you know, who is, who is, who actually has um, lost, you know, his legs yeah. uh, for real, yeah. uh, is lying on the ground in a cemetery. It's in his death scene. And he actually starts to get real hypothermia. So, I mean, yeah, it was that, it was just by being out for the few moments we needed to shoot <laughs> without him, you know. And, uh, you know, it actually gives the look of that scene pretty interesting look because there's a lot of steam and, and, and stuff in the air. So there's some, there's, some, yeah. there's some sequences in the film that I really appreciate from, a, again, I don't know all of them that are actually in the cut that you guys have <laughs> probably seen uh, because uh, they, and there's a reason why the film got recut, which is, so I'm, I'm going through the, through the process of shooting the film. And, and if you guys have specific uh, questions about certain sequences, I, was, I can answer those. But, you know, as I'm going through the, the film, I mean, we're, we're using like, uh, you know, these heaters, these heaters to keep us warm between shots because a lot of it's exterior night. And uh, at a certain point in the shoot, about halfway through, suddenly, uh, I get a visit from the Bond Company, and it was a wonderful woman named B.J. Rack, who has since passed on. Uh, B.J. was one of James Cameron's uh, producers. She was a produ main producer on T2, okay. um, and uh, really understood, you know, filmmaking like I did, and came in. She's there, and, and she's there with a kind of accountant guy, and they're looking at everything, and I'm like, what's going on here? What, what, what's the issue? And uh, uh, later on, I was brought into the fold, and, and as I was continuing to, sh you know, finish the shoot of the film, uh, that there were issues with the money for post production. That some of the money had gone missing, um, and or or just wasn't showing up. I, again, I don't know a lot of some of those details, uh, but it was an, a problem. And I was worried about, okay, well, am I going to get thrown off this film by the bond company? Good news was. I was on time and on schedule with the shoot. And also I had this reef of memos, which was about all these issues. And so BJ being a truth teller and being someone that really knew production said, you know what? You're the only one that knows what's going on here. Uh, I'm keeping you on, but I'm throwing the producers off. Wow. Which she did, which she did. This is, so, by the way, I, I should maybe t say what a bond is because uh, some of your yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. may yeah, not yeah. understand what a completion bond is. A completion bond on an independent film, uh, you don't get in a studio film because a studio film, you know, they, they fund their own films. So they, if they need to fund more to get it finished, they'll do that. They bond themselves. A completion bond gives the, the, uh, the investors in a movie the, uh, you know, the, the comfort that a bond company, an insurance company, yeah, which has sure. a reinsurer above it, will actually finish the movie in case the director goes crazy or something weird happens. It's, you know, there's certain contingencies where a bond is called. And so, and the director in their methodology was basically the guy to take the blame for the bond being called and usually you're thrown off and then they get to just finish the movie on their own. Right. Um, I was never even meant to go into post-production on this movie. Of course, they don't tell you that. <laughs> and, and, and by the way, it would have killed my career because if, if you're a director who gets the bond called on you, then you're basically unbondable, right? Yeah. 
So luckily, BJ Rack, who was a truth teller, saw the actual situation and used her position as the forensics person in the bond company to throw the producers off. Right. Now, the problem is, and I'll, this gets to where, why the cut of the film that exists now exists. Once I did finish that cut, and by the way, get it got through a thousand effect shots being done in India remotely because the bond company wants to do everything as cheaply as possible. Although BJ wanted to do it as, you know, at the highest quality possible, but still I was never able to go to India. I had to do, you know, all of the directing on those effect shots um, over Skype to India. Uh, and uh, they also had things like the Indian New Year come about and then just to stop delivering shots. I mean, it was, it was really a very, very difficult situation. But by the time I get towards the end of delivering the movie with, uh, with the effect shots that were capable of being done on this very low budget and from India, uh, the film, of course, needs to be delivered to the people that own the franchise. They took the movie and they just started ripping it apart, recutting it and saying, we're gonna make tech, you know, I mean, it was, it had no, because I actually show, showed uh, to a few audiences my version of the film and they liked it. It was not, you know, look, it, it's a more limited Highlander film because of the budget and all those things. And there's some issues with that, but it wasn't, it wasn't the absolute disastrous mess that it is right now, which is another thing people should understand that editing is everything. I mean, you could shoot something that, you know, has yeah. <laughs> veracity to, but in the editing, it's all created there. And so if you are, if at the end of the day, that film is taken away from you, and this is the only film uh, I, I have a similar story on Man Thing, by the way. The two films I did back to back both had this kind of cautionary tale, but Man Thing was with Marvel and with Ozzy yeah. Rod. Uh, that's a whole other story. Uh, yeah. But uh, but uh, and and both the films, I'm I'm proud of the visual work I did and the thing, but I wasn't allowed to create the story I wanted to create, and or in in the context of Highlander: The Source, any of the visual uh, components that were supposed to be much have much greater largesse. Uh, weren't really able to be created because of budget and then having a, a group in India do them because the bond company took over. So then it gets handed off. They're furiously recutting the films, change the entire perspective of the film to like, to be the perspective of the mortal woman. They, they, they used, you know, text to rep. I mean, by the time I saw what they started to see again, I have never watched it fully through because I literally, it was so painful. By the time I saw uh, what they had done, I just was, I, I was just living this whole part of my life that I had, you know, struggled to do yeah. uh, something positive for a franchise that I love. I'm a fan like you guys, yeah. you know, really got screwed up. And, and, and I'm not saying, look, I don't shirk all responsibility because you have to deal with the limitations as a director, but man, it was as crazy a uh, cautionary tale of independent filmmaking as you could possibly have, yeah. you know, yeah. where I barely survived because I was going to be thrown off by the bond company. That was their <laughs> idea, you know, and then when that didn't happen, they were so mad. And so, um, and you know, so the, until this day, I feel very, you know, I, I feel sadness in my heart for what happened with Highlander the Source uh, and the fact that every step of the way, it was changed on me, what was actually happening, what the resources were. So dealing with that on a film that has to have a thousand effect shots or more, you're trying to wrap up an entire franchise. You know, it just, it's a bad combination. And probably what I should have done was walk off the movie in all honesty. But I, you know, I'm from Ohio. I'm a guy that believes in completing, you know, what you start. Yeah. And because BJ came on, uh, BJ Rack came on and she, you know, was, was trying to, you know, finish the film with me, but then she couldn't control what they did after that. So uh, I have no idea how to get my cut of this film out there. Um, you know, it's, uh, there's legal issues, of course, uh, but I'd love to show it to you guys at some point just so you can see what it is, because it's very yeah, different. It's that. very different. It's very different, you know, and, and uh, uh, George Callis, who did, I mean, who did the, the score, um, again, they used some of his score in it, but I think they had to shift it so much because of the changes they were doing. He did a great score. We actually went and, and uh, uh, recorded it in Budapest with the Budapest Opera Orchestra, which was fantastic. Cool. It had some amazing musicians on it. Uh, you know, um, Adrian Paul came to Budapest during that and, and we were doing some ADR and, you know, and, and we had a great time. So again, I, I have very fond memories of this film from the, the challenges and the people that I was doing it with, but the shit falling down from on me from on high of this movie, 
I have never experienced anything like it in the rest of my entire career. And uh, it's too bad because they weren't honoring what they had, which is Highlander. You know, it, it was such an amazing thing. And it, it, unfortunately, that wasn't their, there wasn't their raison d'etre. It just wasn't. And it, I, they were just trying to, I think, pump out a final one that they could, you know, eke as much money out of as they possibly could. That's, that's some of my story. If you have any questions, I'm happy to, happy to ask. Well, you yeah. shot this. Obviously, I mean, originally it was going to be a, you know, theatrical feature film, and then it winds right. up becoming a, you know, sci-fi movie of the week. I, I, know. <laughs> I know, which was, and that's where I, I saw it, but I never, they never sent me a cut or anything, what they were doing until it was on sci-fi. That's where I started watching. I'm going, what? I mean, I could not believe that they were using text by a bad text that you could do in like an Avid machine. You know, they, they basically slammed this thing together. Again, the, the film I had uh, that I had finished, although it was, you know, it's a very low budget film. I'm still proud of it. I'm proud of a lot of the things with The Guardian. Uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the character called The Elder was a great Shakespearean actor uh, that we put in this crazy, you know, prosthetic makeup. Uh, there was a lot of digital fixes on the film because we were out in like, you know, sub-zero minus 20 degree weather and the and the prosthetics on the guardian were literally peeling off his body because they were freezing i mean it just just <laughs> was just crazy stuff and he had, you know and and so there was there was a lot of elements of the fact that any movie the film exists at all is actually kind of a miracle um but you know for me it's not the highlander film i wanted to make uh to begin with but my cut is is uh, at least for me closer to uh, you know, the, the aspiration anyway. Yeah. You're cut complete music effects, all that sort of stuff. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. Unfortunately. Uh, and it, it, if I'm able to, you know, get this to you and show you to the film, uh, the, the effects towards the end of the film, again, the Indian group literally just stopped. I, I was trying to get the effects perfected. And of course, when you're doing effects, you, you have sometimes hundreds of iterations. And of course, they were probably under incredible financial strain from the you know bond company to get this done. So they just stopped delivering new effects, and we had to finish the movie. So I put essentially what were temp effects into the final, and the, the, you know they were said, "Oh, we'll get those done later." And you know, but of course, none of that ever happened. Yeah. I don't even know what uh, what those effects in the final sequence of the film ended up being in the final version of the movie that they actually um, sold to the Sci-Fi Channel. So. Uh, but, uh, you know, so the, the effects were not perfect, especially in the big end sequence, which is where it, it, uh, uh, it, it, it hurt it the most, you know, because it was literally the wrap up. Um, again, I, it, you know, the child that they have is the one, you know, in, right. in the, you know, and, and so, uh, and that was what they wanted to do. They wanted to wrap up that aspect. And of course, I wanted to do it in a much more interesting visual way than I was able to, given the the limitations of the of the effects uh, reality that that I was given. So, you know, th this needed to be, you know, at least a twenty million dollar film to do right, and that that would have been cheap. Um, uh, and uh, it was, you know, three. <laughs> so. Can you see the 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 cut? The Sci-Fi Channel was the one you saw parts of. Did you see the Russian DVD version? I didn't see the Russian DVD version. No. Okay, that, that, that came out before the one on the sci-fi channel that was slightly better than the sci-fi version. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it may, it may be closer to what I have as a cut. Uh, again, I don't know because I never saw that. Right. Uh, I, I know that they changed things from my cut no matter what because they were just livid uh, about having lost control. It wasn't even because they thought, I mean, again, we did test screenings and there was, there was a positive reaction to the film. Um, but uh, you know exactly what happened there and made it a bit of a mess uh, yes. in terms of a process. And I was totally out of the process by that point, which is never something I've ever fully experienced before, except man thing was kind of a similar situation um, uh, because of other issues. You know, I've actually told that story before too. So those two films actually, you know, pushed me into becoming a very independent filmmaker. I'd done, you know, things on my own terms ever since then. 
Uh, I've become very involved in virtual reality, as you may be aware, because I've been involved in virtual reality before. So I have a company called Studio Lightship now, with my yeah. partner, Josh Shore, uh, and we are uh, uh, doing some absolutely amazing things that are hybrid, feature film, virtual experience. And now because of COVID, you know, virtual experience is becoming the center of, you know, a lot of verticals uh, in our industry and in, 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 in you know, humanity in general. And so it's a really an interesting time because of uh, this inflection point that we're in. So that's, that's a whole other, you know, podcast, obviously, but, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, I wanted to at least tell the story of Highland the Source. And, and, and as, and again, not as a way of uh, shirking responsibility, but just as a way of, of giving the cautionary tale of this is what sometimes is going on behind the scenes in some of your favorite films yeah you know and and in this context it was an extreme example of that you know um Sorry. because uh i mean one of, as an example one of the other things that was going on <laughs> was uh you know, we, had, we had these Lithu lithuanian drivers and the drivers were uh being uh managed by a, a transportation coordinator a, a female transportation coordinator and my driver, who spoke very, very, very little English, you know, it's okay, Brett, we'll go, don't worry, Brett, it's fine. He, we were, we were shooting at a, a farmhouse outside of Vilnius um, for some of the sequences, and I was take, being brought home at like four in the morning, and suddenly there's a car behind us in this frozen tundra landscape we're in, as the sun is just starting to peak over the horizon, and he, pull, and he pulls out, I said, what are you, hey, dude, what are you doing? What are you pulling over? I'm the director of the film, get me home, I'm, I'm exhausted. Don't, but don't worry, it'll be just a moment, but don't worry. It was a drug deal. The, the, the transportation captain and the transportation uh, department was actually used to, to deliver uh, drug deliveries to different, and so the whole thing had this unbelievable swirl of different things now of course it makes good stories later in life and but yeah. when i was actually experiencing it while i was making the movie sure. uh, to call that challenging would be uh, an yeah. uh, understatement <laughs> <laughs> and and i don't know if you've ever been to lithuania but you know all the women in lithuania are you know blonde seven foot tall supermodels um it's it's got some of the most beautiful women in the world, and all the men look like they were hit with a shovel in their face at birth, uh, <laughs> and they're all walking around with these seven foot. I mean, and and the women control the culture because they're so beautiful. They're the it's a goddess culture, and but of course, you know, one of the other things like we're we're shooting out in this forest, and there's some sequences in a forest. And, uh, you know, I'm just feeling like this weird energy in this forest. So I was asking one of the grips, and again, I had a great relationship with the, with the crew. And he goes, well, Brett, you know, uh, this were mass grave, mass grave here. I'm like, what, what do you mean? Oh, from the World War One, the pogroms, you know, the, the Jews are all bo buried here uh, in the forest, right here where we're shooting. Wow. You know, so I'm putting on a mass grave. I mean, you know, the, the dread coming out of the land in this area was was palpable. Yeah. Uh, uh, you may rem remember the sequence. I'm sure that sequ the sequence is in where the, the, it's, it's, there's this big TV tower. Yeah. And then we blow up the TV tower um, uh, in, uh, in miniature. Uh, and I tried to make that look kind of like the 9-11 TV, you know, collapse. And, and But we're shooting at the TV tower. And I'm looking in the lobby of the TV tower where we're shooting in the actual TV tower. And there's all these pictures of like people lying on the ground and screaming. I'm like, what, what happened here? Well, in 92 or 93, whenever um, the uh, independence for Lithuania happened from the Soviet Union during Glasnost, um, there was uh, an insurrection and the Russian troops came in with tanks and they wanted to control the TV tower. That was the, that was the TV broadcast transmission point for all of Lithuania. And so Lithuanians laid their bodies down around that TV tower and tanks crushed them. Jesus. So they lost their lives. And there were pictures of the people losing their lives by being crushed with tanks uh, in the lobby where I'm shooting. And I'm like, so I realized I was kind of this, the dumb American who was coming into you know, this very rich cultural heritage that also 
had was filled with dread. And, you know, there was a lot. And so that aspect of this was just one of the more interesting parts of, of doing a film there. And, and uh, uh, some of the, you know, landscape and that, that icon of the TV tower really have a lot of meaning to the Lithuanian people. Yeah. So I uh, hope we did that, you know, we, we shot it well enough <laughs> for them. Yeah. So, you know, but uh, so this, you know, just, it was, it was this kind of movie. It just had every, every step of the way had some hidden, agenda hidden layer and as the layers were peeled back it got kind of more and more rotten yeah. um and so uh, unfortunately it's tough to make a good movie mm. under those circumstances it's tough to make a good you know a bad movie under those circumstances to tell yeah, you, the truth. Yeah. you know it's just tough to make a movie uh and you know my my regret is that uh although my cut i i again i like parts of it there's aspects of it i don't like um and they never really finished wanting to finish the, the script correctly. So they, I, I think in their heads, they always thought we're gonna throw this guy off and we're going to you know, recut the movie and figure it out ourselves. Of course they couldn't because they really didn't know what they were doing in all honesty. And uh, uh, the fact that they moved it, I guess, it, again, I haven't seen it full all the way through, but is it her perspective throughout the film? Is that how that they, they're telling the story through Techno Rutan's character's perspective, which, makes no sense because she's immortal she's not the immortal it should be being told through the immortal's perspective you know yeah. and uh you know other thing with adrian paul i should say you know he was a tremendous you know physical man uh who was very very skilled and we did some pretty wild uh, stuff with the knives and you know he he, he 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 was really fun to work with on creating uh the sword uh the sword work and and the knife work and all of that and and that was a great great fun for me and so there was there were positive aspects of it uh but you know at the end of the day it's all about how you finish it and how you bring it all together and it never really got that chance yeah. unfortunately no it's a, it's a huge shame. it's a huge shame. Yeah. um what, one of the things you mentioned earlier about when we were talking about the script is that they had to make compromises compromises yes. for the budget was yes. there anything in particular that you can remember from uh i mean we have we the last episode, which has just gone up on YouTube there, we mm -hmm. uh, we talked about all of the scripts that we had access to, and that stopped yep. pretty much where um, Dimension lost the rights and yes. they reverted back. And by that. the way, by the way, I was originally brought on through Dimension. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then that changed while I was in the process of getting ready to leave from Australia, where I was living at the time, to go to Lithuania to make the movie. So again, it was just a, at every level organizationally, it, it became a mess. And, you know, and, and I, I, I was, you know, the director dancing on the head of a hot pin, you know, <laughs> that just kept shifting on me the whole time. One of the, look, one of the things was uh, that didn't ever get uh, you know, expressed uh, well enough at all was the, you know, trying to wrap up the series uh, in a way, you know, it needed to be done in a way that really uh, had the emotional impact of the kind of emotional impact that the first film had, you know, and, and it was just, it, it wasn't allowed to happen because of the nature of how they wanted to finish the movie and, and they wanted a big visual effects. And, and I was like, well, but actually, you know, if you're going to make the baby the one, you know, you, you, it's got to be an emotional thing. It can't be something that's connected to some, you know, hokey visual, which yeah. is what we ended up doing, you know. And so, so uh, you know, my, my, my storytelling instincts were never really listened to during that process because it was always like, well, that'll take us, we haven't need more locations, it'll be more money, it'll be, you know. And I was battling, I, I really didn't know I was getting into such a tight, you know, low budget film situation with Highlanders. Cause I'd seen the Highlanders. I'm like, well, yeah. this is, you know, yeah. and, they, and they didn't sell it to me that way. So uh, it was, uh, uh, again, it was, it was, it was to be the captain of that ship uh, was a very, very difficult thing because I didn't have the support. There was a mutiny basically going on behind me before I even knew it. <laughs> You know, you know, but you know, again, the positive for me was working with the people I got to work with on it, yeah. uh, and and that was a, a great positive, you know. Uh, but uh, and and it's one of the you know more interesting tales of my career, um, and it also is you know for me a cautionary tale about independent filmmaking. Why I've uh, gone the direction I have gone in my career now is a lot because of the experiences I had on both Man Thing and 
you know, uh, Hollywood source when, you know, previously when I was able to do the things that I really wanted to do, I've, I, I had great success. I mean, the Lawmer Man and T-Rex and IMAX 3D. I mean, I was, I was able to yeah. control those projects. Um, and, uh, and I learned that you can't come on to another group's vision when they don't really have it anyway. Mm-hmm. And, and you're basically, you know, you're, you're handicapped, you're hobbled. Which unfortunately is sometimes what happens uh, yeah. when you're the director of a film and, and uh, you can't control some of the other elements. And, and uh, you know, I, uh, I, I will tell you, I worked really hard on that because I was a fan and I still am a fan. And I look for, now you guys are tracking what's going on. I've always heard they're going to be doing another Highlander. Is that, is that happening? Are they rebooting this? Uh, reboot idea that they're planning, yeah. Yeah, it's, um, uh, at, yeah. At the moment, it's still with uh, Chad Stileski. Um, that's the the plan is that either he will he will direct either well it's a bit woolly either a, 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 a movie or a series yeah. um, either Chad will direct it or maybe one of his team will because of John Wick just continually uh, yeah. going into production um, yes of course yeah but he's he's he, he is impassioned about it which is great yeah no I think he would be great I think that would yeah. be great I love the Wick series and you know yeah. it's it's fantastic and it needs it needs that kind of resource and it needs to be done right. I mean, I just hope, you know, I don't know if the, the way, the reason it's still being delayed is because of rights issues or the, you know, because it, the people involved with that were not the greatest I've met in the business, let me tell you. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and uh, you know, they, they got lucky with the first film because they got a very talented filmmaker and the script was, was really great. And, uh, you know, the Queen score, I mean, all those things came together yeah. uh, in a way that, uh, you know, is rare. Yeah. Uh, at that time, that was an independent feature film, although it had a much bigger budget than what we were dealing with. It still was a, you know, a, a medium budget film for that time. Mm-hmm. And uh, Russell did a fantastic job on it. And, and uh, but they treated him bad, too. We, well, at one point, we wanted to get the uh, directors of Highlander, uh, uh, you know, club together and tell <laughs> horror stories. And the fans are the ones that get shortchanged uh in this in this situation and it's such a great story and it it deserves to be rebooted in the right way for sure yeah. no well, it seems like i mean franchises are kind of dicey to get into i mean i think marvel with marvel studios with iron man going forward they kind of got it that it has to be at at least collaborative if not you're going to hire a director and trust yeah. him to do it but it seems like a lot of other you know highlander Mm-hmm. Uh, early Marvel before Kevin Feige came in. Um, yeah. Mother franchises are like, this is the movie we want to have made. And it doesn't yeah. matter what the director wants. I know, you know exactly. No, this is what's going to be done. And, yeah, you know. exactly, exactly. And by the way, I worked with Kevin. Kevin was the bright spot of me working on um, Man Thing. And I had a great relationship with him. He was a, he's a great guy. He absolutely is a great guy. And But he, he wasn't in the power position at that point. Right. Right. And, uh, uh, you know, just quickly what happened there was uh, I, I cast the movie and developed the film on one script. And then the Hulk came out, the Ang Lee Hulk. Right. And wow. literally, I'm in Australia a few weeks from shooting and a new script starts coming out of the, out of the fax machine at the production office that Avi and Ari Rod created because they were so freaked by the backstory we had in, in uh, Man Thing about, uh, um, which was a father-son origin story. And because there was a father-son origin story with Nick Nolte and Eric Bana in, and they got such crit- they got bashed on it. Anything like that had to be changed. And uh-huh. so I had cast the film already for a complete, and we got basically a completely different script uh, than what we uh, had developed. Uh, the producers um, Scott Carroll and me, and a, a great writer, young writer that that was his assistant. We were, we were we were actually had a really good thing and just as an example of the difference between what, what I wanted to do and what, what happened. Um, at the end of Man Thing, the, you know, the, the sheriff kisses the teacher who they have, you know, had a little bit of a flirtation. In my Man Thing, the Man Thing is the only being left standing. All the protagonists and all the antagonists sink into the swamp. Man is the enemy and the Man Thing as nature is, and, and of course, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a cult horror franchise you know, and so uh, the fans would love that. I mean, the man thing yeah. was the, and no, the man thing had to be destroyed and the, and the sheriff had to kiss the teacher. And I was just like, oh, while I was shooting that shot, 
of pulling back and there, I just literally was wanting to just punch myself in the eye with a, with a stick. Go ahead. You know? Go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, these are, again, if you're, if you're coming on to something and again, it's, you know, these things are changing now, you know, that where you're not able to do your vision and yet you keep going and try, it's, it's always going to end up badly. And, uh, um, and, and, uh, you know, if once you have, you know, developed the movie with one script and then suddenly you're given another script completely different from the character standpoint. So it's miscast now. Everything is wrong. Again, if you look at that film, I'm very proud of the creature. I'm very proud of the visuals. We created a, a swamp, uh, a man-made swamp that was fantastic. I shot it with Technocram. It was, it was great visually, but the story sucks, you know? And, uh, you know, as an example, I was trying to... Uh, uh, improvise on the set to, to just bring a little life to this new script that I was being forced that was being forced down our throats and I sent the dailies you know back and no one from Marvel ever came uh, to California I mean to uh, Australia and I got back the message don't change a word of this script and you know and my, my message back to them was hey man it's not Hamlet um, <laughs> no and that that earned me uh, you know the enmity of uh, some of the top people there because I, I wasn't just buckling to making their bad film. And it ended up the, exactly what happened. Of course, at the end of the day, as the director, you take a lot of the brunt and that's just, that's just the truth. So I learned that I have to do my own vision on films. Uh, and if I had been able to do my own vision on Highland the Source with the right amount of resource, it would be a much different film. That's, yeah. that's the bottom line. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. But if you don't, you know, it's, you know, the stories of films that go bad is, are interesting though. You know, it's an interesting, I mean, you could make a, a cool little, uh, you know, Netflix mini series on the making of, you know, beware of, of beware of independent, yeah. independent film, you know, tales, you know, uh, about the, this, this kind of stuff because, and this is the stuff that's often not talked about because people are scared mm -hmm. to talk about it. at this point, you know, I'm who I am and fuck them all. Uh, so, <laughs> <clears throat> and in the in the you know in the uh, in the in the, the spirit of of Highlander and Connor McLeod, they could all lose their heads. <laughs> so well, you know they they only at the end of the day they only shortchange the fans they shortchange the series you know yeah, yeah and yeah, that yeah. was my motivation is trying to do something that was positive. But again, in in that film, even though I will say that there are there are things that I am proud of. There's some aspects of the of the Guardian that I think are really cool. Mm -hmm. um, some of the, you know, again, the effects we were able to pull off with this incredibly limited budget, like the, you know, the destruction of the, the, the tower and, and, you know, blowing out. I mean, there were some, there were some big moments that, that were uh, in line with, you know, what it should have been, but they just were too few and far between, you know. I was, uh, I was very excited because, I mean, when I read they were bringing in the, the director of Lawnmower Man and Virtuosity, yeah. I'm like, are you kidding me? This is... Yeah like, wow, this is yeah. going to be a great movie. And then I was like, well, what happened? I, I had worked in movies at the time before that. Yeah. And so I knew enough to know yeah. that it wasn't entirely your fault. <laughs> I mean, it, it wasn't, I mean, in all, I mean, I, I was, you know, my, my intentions were, were really good, but it just, you know, when you're battling on multiple fronts, you know, it's like, you know, you learn, it's Sun Tzu and the art of war, you know, you can't <laughs> battle on multiple fronts at the same time. And, and it was, it was that situation. It really was. Yeah. You mentioned the Guardian there and the, uh, some of the sort of a visual effects. There's something I've always wondered, and this is difficult yep. because I don't know whether yep. you've seen this part of yeah. um, it, but the first time you see the Guardian in that kind of TV, yeah. in the TV yeah. tower, um, there is a, an interesting special effect with his mouth. Yes. Um, I think one of us has speculated at some point that maybe the idea was that the Guardian couldn't speak until yes. he'd taken a head. That's correct. Um, so is that's, that... That's actually correct. Yeah, he, he had his own ancient language. Right. And then, you know, he had the, uh, he had the, 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 the neck um, yeah. protector on that then goes away because he's getting close to, you know, taking when he takes uh, Kai's head yeah. in that scene, then he's able to, then he starts to, uh, speak, but it, you may notice he speaks in kind of weird riddles, and he, he repeats yeah. it. You know, cut him, cut him, cut him a cloud. You know, he's like he, he did that stuff. And and you know, Christian Solomento was the one who was creating that part of the character, and and we really wanted to take that a lot farther than hmm. what we were allowed to, because you know he he was a very he's a very interesting actor. He just actually 
Uh, he's directed a few films himself. He just yeah. put one out called This Is Made For You, yes. which is it's actually amazing. fantastic. Yeah. And, and yeah. so he's a, he's a wonder. I've, you know, we've been friends ever since. Uh, I love him like a brother. And we went through hell together. <laughs> yeah. no, no. Source, you know? <laughs> so uh, um, literally hell. I mean, he was in six hours of makeup every morning starting at 3 a.m. You know, before he was able to get and then, and then we still had to digitally fix it because, you know, there was cracking in the, in the frozen tundra of Siberia where we were shooting this thing. So, uh, but yeah, he, he was doing some great things, vis uh, you know, uh, with his body and with his physical performance that, uh, you know, unfortunately were not put in enough of a context uh, in the script. And we were trying to, you know, create those things as we go along. Once, once you're shooting and you're trying to fix things as you go along, you're, as they say in Australia, you're on the back foot, mate. You, you, you're just, you, you're not... Yeah. You're just, you're, you're, it's very difficult. And uh, these are all things I learned on this film in such an extreme situation. Um, uh, and I, I will never make those mistakes again. No. <laughs> so what are you doing now? Are you, I know you're doing, as you say, you're doing a lot of stuff with VR um, mm -hmm. and sort of virtual, you know, BX stuff and things. Are you, are you, as well as that, are you looking to sort of do more sort of narrative based oh, yeah. or film? Absolutely. I, I have a film coming out uh, toward the end of this year called Triumph, which stars uh, Terrence Howard, Academy Award nominee Terrence Howard, a great actor, and R.J. Mitty from Breaking Bad, uh -huh, who played yeah. his son in Breaking Bad. Uh, it is a completely different genre than I've done before. It's a, it's an inspirational sports story, yeah. um, where a, a young man with cerebral palsy wants to uh, wrestle in the mid 1980s. So it's basically like a, a, a an inclusionary um, sports story, John Hughes style high, high school sports story film. Uh, but with this inclusionary element. And also the man who wrote it, Michael Coffey, has cerebral palsy as well. So um, it really is, uh, and that's one of the reasons I got onto it because it, it's coming from uh, you know, a, an authentic place and it's, it's kind of semi-autobiographical to Michael and his experience. And uh, I shot it in Nashville, with a great crew in Nashville. But again, there was, I mean, I shot this movie six years ago. Wow. And it has been a... Uh, the producer on this one um, basically uh, made off with the funds, and uh, we were supposed to get this. This is this is kind of a fun thing. I mean, this is another fun thing. Um, so the coach in the film that Terrence Howard ended up playing was supposed to be played by Kevin Spacey. Now this is before the Kevin Spacey. You know, this is six years ago, so it was before the Kevin. Spacey. Yeah. Can you imagine having? A Kevin Spacey high school wrestling picture. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> that, that would never get. Oh, I actually got saved on that because the 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 uh, the producer uh, was nefarious, and um, and so uh, it it you know the film had to go into bankruptcy and all these things, and then be brought out by the by the investors, and then I was you know uh, with it the whole time, pretty much as a producer myself, trying to get it done, and then. When Terrence came on, we were able to finish the film uh, in a really good way, and and I'm proud of the film. So that that's happening. But but everything I'm doing is from the standpoint of storytelling. You know, the technological aspects of of virtual reality and all that are something I understand and know. Uh, but it's all about trying to infuse this new medium with storytelling. And you know, that's what I did with Lawnmower Man. It really told the story of VR in a way that made it you know popularize the term and the concept and and we're virtuosity in, in a different, uh, you know, sort of angle, same thing. And so uh, uh, I am now doing that with hybrid projects. Uh, you know, I, do you guys know uh, the, the, the puzzle game Cicada 3301? Are you familiar with that? I've heard of it. Oh, yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, my company, we're, we are doing uh, uh, a project around Cicada 3301 with the creator of the puzzle game because and, mo nice. and that's a very big secret thing. So we're going to be revealing who the creator is uh, and re helping relaunch that, that uh, game. It's very apropos to the moment because, you know, it was th that, that con the cryptology and stenography in uh, the puzzle game was, it was embedded with, you know, uh, conspiracy, uh, you know, truths nice. and all kinds of things. So we're in a moment in culture right now where, boy, is that apropos. Yeah, and, so, and that's going to have both a you know narrative uh, a docu series is one of the first things we're doing with it. We're talking to all the OTT platforms with that, and then creating an AR game extension of Cicada 3301 
with the new AR technology that's capable on all the smartphones. And, you know, as you may be aware, Apple is going to be coming out with their AR glasses uh, at some point soon, really changing the delivery um, aspect of what we're going to be able to do with things like that. So it's a very exciting time for me, very exciting time for me. And, and you know, the, the, the Highlander, uh, the sort, it was the sort of the end, the punctuation point on the end of me being a director for hire uh, for, you know, things that weren't, uh, well, I mean, I, I, again, I got on it because I was a fan, you know, damn. And, uh, but, uh, you know, it, it really taught me a lot to then now move into where I'm, I'm controlling my own destiny on the things I'm doing. And look, it's a great time because the medium I've been part of, uh, from the beginning VR is now becoming something that is going to need to be delivered. I mean, the truth is Highlander should be what I call a story world. And it should be more than just a narrative feature film. And by the way, I mean, I'll let you know what I'm doing with Lawmer Man. I'm I'm been developing El Man Reborn. Uh, again, there are rights issues because the guys are, you know, the guys that did the original film. You know, it's hard to even find where the rights are at this point. But I'm going to create it as a story world, interactive world environment where the interaction of the fans of the people will actually lead through procedural AI technology to creating the story that will then be expressed in the feature film. So I wanna make it the first truly crowdsourced, fandom sourced story for a franchise. Wow. And, uh, and because, you know, since you guys are in the fandom world, you know, the truth is fandom is not just a passive thing anymore. And it hasn't been for a while, as yeah. you know, and I believe that it, the, the, we're going to move into an era with the kind of technology I'm working with where fandom is literally part and parcel of the creation, the authorship uh, of, of worlds. Because really these IPs are worlds, you know. The fact that there isn't a, a Game of Thrones world that you can go into makes no sense to me because... My God, it starts with a map. I mean, it's like a world, you know. <laughs> I mean, I mean, and and, uh, and 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 the technology to do it is there. It's just about the, you know, the vision and the and the and the will to create these things. And so, uh, you know, I I consult to the studios on this stuff, and and there's reasons why. Uh, but now with the inflection point of COVID, and everything changing in the entertainment business, yep. I mean, we are in the true dissolving of Hollywood 1.0 is gone, guys. It's gone. Yep. And that's yep. not a bad thing. Again, it couldn't happen to nicer people, uh, you know. And 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 <laughs> there's, there's going to be a a resurgence, a renaissance of what's of what's possible and what's how uh, stories are going to be delivered. And look, there's a whole generation coming up that is going to demand immersion and interaction. Yeah. yeah. In their w worlds, I mean, and and they're going to, you know, just a static uh, story is not going to be enough anymore. And Highlander is the perfect thing. It's such a rich world. And you could create such a story world around that and then allow the feature films to express what happens in the interaction of that world. And I think that'd just be so amazing, but it's, uh, it's going to happen, but it's, it's gonna happen in the new amalgam that's coming out of uh, the destruction, wh whatever rises from, you know, the phoenix that rises from the ashes yeah. of the old Hollywood. And, you know, look, I, I have a lot of, you know, uh, romance and and tradition you know i love old hollywood and i love i love what happened but it just doesn't exist anymore and it, and it became something where it was it's all based on deal structure as opposed to being based on making great films except for you know there's obviously still great films made um you know the the what's happened with uh, the superhero movies i think what kevin has done is absolutely phenomenal uh but there's some other aspects that haven't been so phenomenal <laughs> and so you know there's a, there's a great uh, resurgence and a clean slate that can happen with these new emerging mediums uh, blending with traditional cinematic storytelling in a way that really has doesn't come along once every hundred years yeah. and so yeah. it's a tremendous opportunity and it really is going to involve the world of fandom in a much more organic way than ever before and I'm actually uh, probably partly because of my experience with Highlander and and and, and making something that didn't satisfy the fan I mean I I, I have you know, I have a real uh, passion for, for including that. Mm -hmm. Well, as I, I think we've discussed here, but I've uh, discussed on other podcasts too, that in, except in very, very, very rare occasions, nobody sets out to make a bad movie. No, I mean, no, no one does. The best no, you can. No one and, does, exactly. Exactly you know, right. And, and uh, 
Uh, and all you can do when you do make something that doesn't fully come together is sort of hold on to the pieces that you're proud of and yep. just sort of let go of the rest. You know, it's just unfortunate. I mean, I could have taken my name off it. I probably should have, in all honesty, taken my name off of the film because it really wasn't my film at the end of the day. Um, right. But uh, I thought, well, you know, I'll just, you know, I'll just, I'll take what comes. And, and I, I knew I would get to tell this story someday. So thanks guys. <laughs> uh, well, no, thank you. And I'm so glad that you, uh, that you were happy to do that. I was, you yeah. know, I was, I wasn't sure if you would. Um, so yeah, no, I'm very glad when yeah, I got yeah, the yes. Yeah. Some people like to hide their heads under, you know, if they made something that doesn't get uh, the response that they want, you know, they, they have, but I think there's, there's an, I'm a storyteller. So there's an interesting story in everything, you, you know? <laughs> okay, guys, listen, thanks so much. Let's, uh, uh yeah, but thank you so much. This is Brett Leonard reminding you to hold fast and don't lose your head. I think we need to start the uh, the release, the uh, Leonard cut. Uh, I, I would yes. love to do that. I'd love to do that. <laughs> <laughs>